Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around our world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Akea. Today's episode is focusing on Maohi Nui Movement for Human Rights and Justice, looking at indigenous peoples of the Pacific, standing for self-determination and paths for peace. Today, we're joined by a foremost journalist and researcher in the Pacific, Nick McClellan. Thank you for joining us and being able to share with us a bit about what's happening in this vast Moana Nui Akea. Josh, thanks for the welcome to join you today. You've been uh, most recently returning from the Marshall Islands where they were just focusing on the legacy of nuclear colonization and the 70th test of Bravo. Could you share with us a bit about what was going on in the Marshalls and the main issues that are being raised? In Majuro, the capital of the Marshall Islands, there was a week of commemoration for the massive atmospheric nuclear test, uh, codenamed Castle Bravo, that was held on the 1st of March, 1954. And 70 years later, the Marshallese people are still living with a range of legacies from that uh, nuclear test, um, cultural, economic, health, and especially environmental. Um, people may know that the Marshalls uh, was part of uh, a UN strategic trusteeship after the Second World War, the trust territory of the Pacific Islands, which also covered neighbouring uh, um, atolls and nations in uh, Micronesia and Palau. Um, the US military administered that strategic trusteeship. And, you know, the, the islands were always central for the nuclear era, the bomb that uh, the plane that dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki flew from Tinian in the Marianas Islands. And in 1946, the US military began a testing program um, of atomic and hydrogen bomb weapons. Ultimately, there were 67 nuclear tests in the Marshall Islands, followed by another 24 nuclear tests on Christmas Island, which today is part of the uh, uh, Republic of Kiribati. There were also rocket launches from Johnston or Kalama Atoll, um, which were used for high altitude explo explosions in 1962. One of the blasts put out the lights in Honolulu. So that nuclear era was symbolized by the Bravo test. It was the largest uh, uh, human made explosion in world history at the time it happened in 1954. Sadly, later there were even bigger tests. But this was 15 megatons of explosive yield. That's the equivalent of about um, 15 million tons of TNT explosive, a thousand times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. And plumes of radioactive fallout spread across the Marshall Islands. Um, at the times, the at the time, the U.S. authorities acknowledged that uh, at least four atolls in the north of the country, um, Rongalap, Utrik, Alinglalai. Inuitok were affected, um, but uh, documents released some 40 years later showed that virtually every atoll in the Marshall Islands had uh, received uh, varying levels of low-level radiation. Um, obviously, people are looking back to that time today because they face the consequences of that in many parts of life. And it is devastating, and it shows how it lingers today. And we know the UN, uh, Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, began doing work. That We know the Human Rights Council with Pacific Island countries starting to assume a larger role in that new body have also brought up nuclear and human rights. Can you share with us some of the conversations that you maybe had and what was being discussed in the Marshall Islands 70 years later, but what is still of course, on the minds and hearts and conscience of the people of Marshall Islands. The, um, the day on the anniversary on the 1st of March is referred to as Nuclear v Victims Remembrance Day. Uh, on the day, there was a range of activities, a march through the capital Majuro, speeches by uh, uh, President Hilda Heine of the Marshall Islands, uh, uh, who's just been re-elected to the post, um, a, a number of activities. But I sometimes find the notion of nuclear victims is, is wrong because right from the beginning of the nuclear age, uh, 
Pacific Islanders, Marshall Islanders, were involved in protesting against the nuclear testing program. For example, in uh, 1954, immediately after the Castle Bravo test, um, customary leaders, Euroj of the Marshall Islands, together with school teachers, businessmen and leading citizens, sent a petition to the UN Trusteeship Council calling for an end to nuclear testing by the United States, calling for protection of land, which is central to identity and culture and human rights, and so on. So from 1954 to today, Marshall Islanders, like other Pacific peoples, have been actors against nuclear testing, not simply as victims. And you can see that in international diplomacy, as you mentioned. Um, Kira, uh, Marshall Islands joined the um, uh, UN Human Rights Council in 2019. In October 2022, uh, an important resolution was passed uh, pledging United Nations support for um, uh, technical assistance and capacity building uh, programs to achieve the realisation of human rights for Marshallese in relations to the nuclear legacy. And while I was in Majuro just in the first week of March, um, officers of the uh, UN High Commission of Human Rights were in uh, Majuro organising workshops, talking with localese, uh, local Marshallese uh, politicians, uh, uh, officials from the government, community activists and representatives, looking at what are the barriers to the realisation of human rights that come from these nuclear legacies. And that covers everything from uh, um, the right to a clean, safe environment, which has obviously been challenged by decades of radioactive pollution, the right to health, um, all sorts of rights uh, are challenged by the legacies, even 70 years after testing. Um, and uh, the testing finished in 1958, but the legacies linger to this day. It really does look at really common Article 1 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic Social Rights it goes all the way to the right of self-determination. And of course, as you were pointing out, Marshall Islands is not the only place. Unfortunately, as we look at the Maohi Nui movement for human rights and justice, Tahiti is a very important space as well. Maybe you could share with us a bit about the Tavini government, what's going on there, but also the historical aspect of Mururo and what all that was, Tahiti was also a positive agent for social change to change the direction and challenge colonialism up front with a vision of peace and justice for all. Right through the last quarter of a century of the 20th century and continuing today, there's a movement for a nuclear free and independent Pacific a social network right across the Pacific Islands and for indigenous peoples of the Pacific Rim, including Hawaii. Uh, Kanaka Maoli were centrally involved in this network. And as the name suggests, it wasn't just talking about nuclear free, but about independence, about the questions of self-determination, of political status, and indeed a transition towards independence and sovereignty, reclaiming indigenous sovereignty with new statehood. Tahiti Maui Nui, so-called French Polynesia, was colonised by France in the late 19th century. It's recognised by the United Nations General Assembly as uh, what they dub a non-self-governing territory. So France is the administering power of uh, French Polynesia, so-called. Um, it's a colonial situation even today, well into the 21st century. That was officially recognised in 2013 when uh, Maui Nui was reinscribed on the United Nations list of non-self-governing territories. And that means the UN Special Committee on Decolonization, this international structure that looks at these questions of self-determination and statehood, uh, has been monitoring the case over the last decade. You know, there's been a long protest. We don't have time today to go into the whole history of resistance to uh, nuclear weapons in Maui Nui, just as in Marshall Islands, in Australia, in Kiribati, across the world. But... Um, you know, in 1915, the great Tahitian nationalist Bovana Opa went around uh, on a copra boat collecting signatures for the Stockholm Peace uh, Appeal, which was a global peace appeal to end nuclear testing. Um, right through the 70s, there were um, uh, both the indigenous Maui people 
and supporters like Benton Marie Torres Danielson, who campaigned to raise international awareness of testing. And that's grown over time, and you've had a number of groups um, within um, uh, the country who continued to follow on with this issue. Once again, testing ended after 30 years, 193 atmospheric and underground tests at Mururoa and Fungatorf Atolls. People still campaign on the legacies. You have uh, a very active church movement, particularly the uh, Protestant Maui Church is very involved in this question. A number of community associations, uh, such as Association 193, uh, the number is the number of nuclear tests. There's an association of former um, uh, test site workers. Um, throughout the 30 years of French testing, there were hundreds, uh, thousands of Maui workers who went down alongside the French military and worked as divers, as truck drivers, as labourers, and customs officers, a whole range of positions. And today they have an association, Mururo Itato, uh, Mururo and Us, which campaigns for compensation, uh, for reparations, for recognition. And above all, the political party, Tavini Hui Ratiro no Teo Maui, which is the um, major pro-independence party, founded originally by Oscar Temeru, a long-time independence supporter and, uh, and campaigner. But what we've seen in recent times is the rise of a new generation of pro-independence activists who are now in government. No, and that reminds me of the time being there at the Abolition 2000 conference. And you saw the peaceful protests with the Fafaru, with the fish. You saw the challenges in court. You saw also the massive march that were able to go through the streets of Papa Ete. And it's exciting to see now Temaru being an elder statesman, going to the UN, getting Tahiti at the UN General Assembly, working with C24 to put Tahiti back on the map, but also that next generation coming forward, really sharing and tomorrow connecting with Kanaki, as we'll get into a little bit later. What are the current steps that the Tavini government is sharing and what do you see as the most important initiatives taking place in the islands right now? One of the really interesting things has been that um, over time, key Tavini members, key supporters of independence, have taken up positions in legislatures um, across the country, regionally and internationally. Um, in 2017, uh, Motai Brotherson won for the first time a seat in the French National Assembly. Um, French Polynesia has three seats in the National Parliament in Paris um, as part of the uh, uh, French colonial empire, um, and it was unprecedented. The, the Tavini party hadn't held a, a seat uh, before. In a stunning and unprecedented uh, victory a few years later, in June 2022, all three seats in the French National Assembly were won by Tavini members. And alongside Brotherson, who's um, in his early 50s, you had Steve Shreil, who's a former lecturer at the University of Hawaii, a, a linguist, a, a real cultural leader. Uh, he's in his mid-30s. And Timothy Lagayek, who's 21 years old, the youngest person ever elected to the French National Assembly. And so um, Oscar Temeru, who's now uh, in his late 70s, has been campaigning for decades, you see in this political party a rise of a younger, new generation. And that was shown with these elections in uh, um, April, May uh, 2023, just last year, where Tavini won a majority in elections for the Assembly of French Polynesia, the local parliament. They now have a, um, a really strong representation in the parliament and Moatai Brotherson left his seat in the French National Assembly, campaigned and won for the presidency. So here you have a new generation stepping up. Oscar Temaru retains his position as mayor of FAR, but he's encouraged younger um, activists to step up and take their role. And you see a whole range of initiatives where Moatai Brotherson has travelled to the Pacific Islands Forum um, since 2016, both French Polynesia and New Caledonia, have been full members of the regional political organisation that unites Australia, New Zealand and independent island nations. 
the two French territories are now are full members. And so Brotherston's sitting alongside his international counterparts talking about what's dubbed the Blue Pacific Agenda around oceans, around uh, fisheries, around telecommunications, tourism and transport, all of the issues that uh, bind people together, most importantly, preserving the ocean environment. Um, Brotherson's a strong campaigner against deep seabed mining. He's also, and this is the biggest security issue for every island nation, campaigning around climate change, um, you know, wanting stronger, faster, urgent action on the climate emergency. Having said that, they haven't forgotten the nuclear issues, the legacies. Um, on the 28th of September last year, in 2023, the Assembly of French Polynesia passed a resolution um, endorsing the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. This is a nuclear ban treaty, calls for abolition of nuclear weapons, um, but it's quite unique amongst disarmament treaties in that it has provisions calling for assistance to nuclear survivors and environmental remediation of nuclear test sites. And that's vitally important given that there are enormous health impacts on the Maui people from generations of nuclear testing, uh, very high rates, for example, of thyroid cancer amongst women, amongst the highest rates of thyroid cancer in the world per capita, um, enormous environmental devastation of Muluroa and Fanga Atoll, Fangatofa atolls, which are still polluted by uh, um, plutonium, uh, americium, cesium, and other uh, radioactive isotopes that are hazardous to health. Um, so, you know, the new government is now positioned to do this. It's striking, you know, France still controls foreign policy, um, defence security issues as a colonial power, as the administering power of, of, of the country. But the decision by the Assembly to endorse the nuclear ban treaty uh, to call for assistance to nuclear survivors, to call for environmental remediation, is a shot across the bows to the government in Paris under President Emmanuel Macron. It's saying, you know, we want to address nuclear legacies once again, as with the Marshall Islands, in the context of our right to self-determination, our right to health, our right to a clean, safe environment. They've called on Paris to respect the treaty as a norm of international law. Now, Paris doesn't agree. The French government uh, has uh, actively resisted the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Nonetheless, the treaty's got 70 ratifications already around the world, 93 signatories. It's becoming a new norm of customary international law, and that's important for all the survivors of nuclear testing, not just in the Pacific, but across the world. And that really brings up the excitement of multilateralism, municipal multilateralism, and people organizing, as you said, from the mayor position to the assemblies to then challenge at every point what has happened, but more importantly, demanding a new direction rooted in dignity and diplomacy. And as you look at that in Tahiti, and as you did weave in the historical with the current climate justice of going for 1.5 you really do point out how the Pacific have been put on that altar to sacrifice in the name of security with nuclear, but then now in the stake of really globalization and an economy, once again being asked to be sacrificed again. But it is the Pacific, as you shared, with a young leader in the 20s in a national parliament, but also at the COPs, at the climate summits under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Conference of Parties. It's a Pacific that led the way, the high ambition coalition that demanded 1.5, that demanded 350 parts per million as it's measured on Mauna Loa here to make sure that today with the Cyclone 5 categories hitting Vanuatu twice in one week and all the other examples, of course, with Maui and the wildfires, that climate justice is the most important issue today to make sure that people have that right to a clean, healthy, safe environment, but a new way going forward you also have been big part of Kanaki, of New Caledonia, who's also been active as well. Could you share with us some highlights of, of what's going on now and historically, how they've also made sure that the voice of the Kanaki people is heard around the world? Kanaki is the local name uh, for the islands of New Caledonia, Nuva Caledonia, which is um, about 1,500 kilometers off the coast of Queensland in Australia. It's a Melanesian nation, unlike uh, 
uh, the Maui Polynesian people of uh, French Polynesia, once again colonised by France in um, uh, the 19th century. It's had a history in some ways similar to Australia. It was a penal colony originally. Then there was free settlement where France in the late 19th century brought uh, um, families from uh, France to uh, uh, settle the land. Of course, that was an empty land. It was land stolen from the indigenous Kanak people, the Melanesian people of the islands. There were resistance uh, from the beginning in 1878, a revolt by Chief Atai, uh, 1917 during the First World War, while Kanak soldiers were off fighting in France. Uh, Chief Noel led another rebellion uh, against French colonisation. Since the Second World War, there's been a rise of uh, consciousness amongst the the uh, the Kanak people. Um, a great leader, Jean-Marie Chabal, who was sadly assassinated uh, in the 1980s, um, really was central in, in mobilising Kanak cultural identity and pride through uh, such as a festival in 1975, uh, Melanesia 2000. He led the main political party, Union Caledonienne, to take up a position not just of greater autonomy from Paris, but in fact of independence. Um, once again, time's short, so I can't go through a much complex process, but there's a strong independence movement, a nationalist movement, drawing support from the majority of the Indigenous Kanak people, but also supporters from other ethnic communities, people from the uh, long-term European settlers, people um, from Polynesia or uh, Asia who come as mine workers for the nickel, uh, the nickel industry, uh, the main industry in New Caledonia. And today there's a body called the FLNKS, the Kanak Socialist National Liberation Front. Once again, like uh, um, Maui Nui, there is a leader, a uh, president, who is pro-independence Kanak leader, a guy called Louis Mapu, who is a member of the Party of Kanak Liberation, the Speaker of the Congress, uh, the local parliament in Numia, is Rokwamitong, once again, another Kanak independence leader, long-time member of uh, Union Caledonienne, the main pro-independence political party. And so this coalition of pro-independence forces, which has both parties, uh, church members, community groups, women's organisations, is campaigning for the right to self-determination. There's been a, a difficult process. Um, an agreement called the Numir Accord was adopted uh, more than uh, nearly 30 years ago in 1998. Um, it set the framework for creating local political institutions and a transfer of powers from Paris to Numir. But it culminated with three referendums on self-determination. The first two, uh, the Kanaks mobilised and uh, got a significant vote, 43% um, in favour of independence for the first vote, 46 uh, and a bit, nearly 47% um, in the second. And then France changed the rules, uh, rushed through the third referendum in uh, the middle of the COVID pandemic where people couldn't campaign and um, only 3% of people voted yes. The Kanak people basically boycotted. Non-participation was the watchword. And today there's talks, what happens next? When you look at that, what would you say might be some of the steps going forward? Because Jean-Marie Gibao was so powerful. I remember his writing about France being this lost new, this coconut floating in the Pacific without any roots, knowing where it's going, but that his people, the Kanaki, know who they are and where they are, and that this is really the, the wisdom that's needed when we look at the global challenges facing humanity. Maybe can you share a bit about what's going on today, but also why that voice is so vital going forward for all of the world? Well, once again, the current government of, of New Caledonia, led by Louis Mapu, like President Brotherson of Maui Nui, French Polynesia, is working to uh, really promote the integration of the territory into its regional neighbourhood. Um, you know, they're setting up trade negotiations with neighbouring countries, independent countries like Vanuatu. There's actually been a delegation of politicians from both uh, Tahiti and uh, Numia in uh, Australia um, trying to build links with the largest economic power in the region. Um, people are not, no longer simply looking to France, although France remains the major military power, the colonial power in, the, in these islands, 
um, still uh, finances the, the budget, but people are looking at alternatives. And um, so through their membership of the Pacific Islands Forum, um, both Mapu and Brotherson have attended the international summits with uh, the president of South Korea, even with Joe Biden in the White House in September last year. Um, you know, the, there's a tension between France's Indo-Pacific strategy, its geopolitical games at a time of US strategic competition with China, and the desire of indigenous peoples in the Pacific to control their own land, to control their own water, to you know, promote human security, human development, educational opportunities, um, but to do it in a very Oceanian way, in a very Pacific way um, that recognises the depth of history, of language, of culture that still exists despite decades, century of French colonisation. Um, and so you see that spirit, as I say, it, it meshes with this broader sense of the blue Pacific, the notion that Pacific Island communities and governments must forge their own path at a time of incredible geopolitical complexity and contest in the Pacific Islands. Um, you only have to read the papers to see that, um, uh, you know, China dominates uh, most media coverage of the Pacific, but that misses what's going on on the ground where people want to control their own future. People are happy to engage with France. Jean-Marie Chabal, before his death, uh, famously said, that independence would allow us to manage our interdependencies. So the Kanak people or the Maui people want to engage with their neighbours, want to engage with the world around them on the questions of the, that the world faces, the climate emergency, the plague of violence against women in the home, the workplace, the community, the challenge of education that's appropriate to people's culture and identity, all those sorts of issues, they want to participate in those human rights initiatives around the world and they see self-determination and political independence as a step towards being able to manage that transition towards a better future. Very important to weave in women's rights as well as we focus on International Women's Day coming up and connecting all those aspects of women holding up half the sky but making sure that the indigenous perspective of feminism, of the way the world is, is treated as equal. And Indigenous people's campaigns for positive social change in the Pacific is growing. We really appreciate your perspective because Maui Nui demand individual dignity and collective democracy, proposing alternative paths for peace and reconciliation with a future that's rooted in, as you said, that contested space, but more importantly, rooted in that rich culture, understanding the interconnectedness with the natural world. And that point that you shared of the Blue Pacific absolutely essential going forward in 2050, but making sure that there is a world and a place for us all to live in. Look, I think the, the role of women is central. You know, there's a French law called the Loi de Parité, which uh, is designed to ensure that representation in legislatures in France and in their colonies um, includes uh, uh, women. And so the uh, Loi de Parité electoral lists have to have men and women alternating on the lists. That's meant that nearly half the Congress of New Caledonia is women. In 2004, the president and vice president were both women. Um, the vice president, Dewa Garode, one of the, sadly passed away, but one of the leading authors, poets, writers of the Pacific, uh, an incredible woman. Um, in Tahiti, uh, uh, there are strong women. Uh, the vice president, once again, of uh, French Polynesia uh, has taken up that role. You know, there's a... Uh, women hold up half the sky in the Pacific, it's about 80%. Um, there's a strong representation in the French territories in legislatures that is not replicated in many of the independent island countries. So it's not simply that uh, Maui Nui needs support from the Pacific. Other Pacific nations can learn something from Maui Nui, from Kanaki, from the struggles that they've had and the path that they've set forward. Especially as you shared it, Hilda just started her term again in the Marshalls. It's exciting to see the women creating that role. And really, it's an expression of centuries of old tradition of relationship with nature and making sure that we have a better way for all of us in the world going forward. Nick, mahalo nui for making time. And thank you all for watching today. Thank you for sharing.